team fights and positioning. That is what we will be discussing in this video, friends. This is... It's a complicated topic because there's so many... Just think of how many possible hero combinations, item combinations, where you fight on the map, how the game is going, all these different scenarios, how many people are in the fight. So much. We could never possibly cover every example. So what we're going to do, actually, is try to break it down to a conceptual level, um, something that can be discussed, and that will set the groundwork for you to then be able to analyze a specific fight. And maybe it's after the game has gone. You can analyze it and decide, this is where we went wrong. This is what should have happened. Or hopefully, it'll get to the point where you will be able to be in the game and you will see the lineups and be able to predict this is the kind of team fight we need to take, um, and these are the ones we need to avoid. It's, I, I feel like that's the best we can do because, like I said, there are so many examples that could be covered, and it's just like not practical to try. Um, positioning is technically a separate topic, but I feel like they go hand in hand, so we're going to cover them both here. And we're just going to go into it because I feel like that's all I have to say for the intro. Okay, let's cover team fight roles first. Now, this is just how I think of a team fight. Um, there are many ways you could consider this. Um, and I do, like always, I recommend you come up with your own ideas. But we'll start with how I think about it, I guess. And you guys can go from there. So first, let's just cover what each role is. Many of these overlap to some degree. Um, but let's just start. Initiator. So a lot of you have heard this term. It is what it sounds like. It's someone who begins the fight. Usually they go in first, oftentimes with some kind of hard crowd control, like a stun. Um, a silence will work sometimes, like in the case of going on a storm spirit, where if you silence him, he can't. he's kind of slow and can't zip. And a lot of his abilities all rely on using spells. So if he's silenced, he's pretty useless. Um, so sometimes the silence can work, but it's often some kind of stun because in that case of Storm Spirit, say he gets silenced, he could BKB or Yules and then get away. And that's why stuns are usually what you use for initiating because, you know, they just can't, you can't use an item when you're stunned. Um, hexes as well. Just hard crowd control. Then we have counter initiator. This is almost the same as an initiator except that you don't want to go in first. It's difficult to argue that one... What am I saying here? Usually, there's a lot of overlap. So if you're an initiator, you can counter-initiate, and vice versa. But I do think there is a noticeable difference. Um, and it's, it's a little hard to explain. Well, let's just go into it. Let's say... Let's say an initiator is like a someone with a blink and a stun. Let's say like blink lion, if we're thinking about hard supports. Lion finds a target, he blinks, he hexes them immediately, they have almost no time to react. Follow up stun as hex is ending. Maybe he uses finger to burst them. That's getting down to the damage category, but you know, that was a initiation. And yes, you could counter initiate like that too, where the enemy goes on your carry, so you blink, hex them, and then stun. So yeah, he could do one or the other. Um, but I would say that oftentimes you are looking for the kill first when you are like a blink lion. Um, and then other people with blinks and stuns, so like Beastmaster, Axe, all of these people. Pudge, I think, is a good example of a someone who wants to initiate, begin the fight with a hook, that kind of thing. Counter-initiator, you don't like to go in first. You would rather wait for something to happen. Oftentimes, it is for someone to use a certain spell, like you're waiting for someone to BKB and that BKB to wear off, or you are waiting for them to group up first before going in. Um, you, you have this prerequisite that you would like to see before going in. So Enigma, he has a BKB piercing ult. He would love for the enemy team to all be grouped together. And he also... Well, he doesn't strictly want them to be BKB'd, but it's also kind of nice because then you are wasting their BKB duration and like their BKB is up, but they are still being disabled. They hate that. You know, they would much rather get BK they would rather be black holed and not have BKB going and then use it after and try to fight, 
or you know just die and buy back and then have it um so he he needs them to be grouped up and you know the bkb thing it could be nice one way or the other but of course the higher level you get people will realize i'm against enigma i do not want to be grouped up near my team and they're just they're just going to stand apart and that makes it very difficult for enigma to go in first he's only ever going to be able to commit his black hole to like one maybe two heroes and it may not be the ones he wants like he might get the offlaner and a four support but maybe he really wanted to get the the oracle that was standing in the back or something and it was just very hard to get to that oracle so i think a good way to think about it is that a counter initiator usually has a really high cooldown spell that is often aoe and they don't want to just use it on a single target sometimes you will but often you don't Whereas think like Sand King, that's such a low cooldown spell. It matches the cooldown of Blink almost. So anytime he sees someone, he can just Blink stun. And if it doesn't work out, it's like, whatever. We'll try again in like 10 seconds. But Enigma, if he messes up Blink Black Hole, it's like, back up guys, three minutes. And then, then we can go again. You know, it's a really long cooldown. Um, another example, let's, uh, thinking about supports, Phoenix is a good counter initiator. Like Phoenix doesn't want to just dive in and ult. People are just going to, you know, it's like, okay, Phoenix is here, BKB, kill this egg. Or they have no reason to be in the fight anymore. They're like, we haven't really committed anything, let's get out. Um, that's another way to think about it. You want the enemy team to be committed to the fight before going in, um, because then it's very difficult for them to get out. So, like, after, let's say, Slardar goes in first for your team, the enemy team reacts, they go on Slardar. Now Phoenix dives into the side a bit and ults, and the enemy team is like, oh, what do we do? We just used our blinks onto Slardar. Now Phoenix is over there. Like, it's really awkward to run over there. Like, do we try to get out of this fight? Phoenix, like, Phoenix Egg is going, so maybe we do, but the Slardar is just going to bash one of us. And like, oh, maybe we need to fight. It becomes very difficult. Uh, Treant Protector, another one who wants to counter-initiate because if you initiate with... Um, I play so much Treant Protector. Why can't I Overgrowth? Uh, <laughs> I forgot it for a second. If you count, if you initiate with Overgrowth, it's technically just a root, which means they can Manta it, they can PKB, and then they'll they'll be okay. But it's a unique root in the fact that it can pierce BKBs. So if you actually wait for them to BKB, you can then root um, with Overgrowth, and then unless they have another way to purge it, they're actually stuck there while BKB is going. And they are not a fan of that. Um, and so that's why Treant prefers to be a counter initiator. So there is this difference between the two, in my opinion. And some prefer to be counter initiators, but can initiate if they need to. But that is when you'll often find that like the game is hard. Like say your team only has Enigma as your initiator or counter initiator. Because he prefers to be a counter initiator, you're going to find the game is very difficult. And you're going to find like, well, we're waiting for Enigma to go in. And Enig Enigma's like, well, I'm waiting for them to group up. And there's no reason for them to group up. So like, I can never go in, which means you guys can never go in, which means this fight just never happens. And it gets so awkward. I think that's enough about those. Let's talk about frontliners. Again, this overlaps a bit with initiators and counter initiators. A frontliner is just someone who is usually very survivable, often because they are very tanky, like, a lot of health or armor and magic resist, usually a combination of all three. They're not just someone, survivable may not have been the best word because like Puck is survivable because it's so, she's so, he, whatever is so, I don't know what that, what is Puck? Is Puck? Anyways, Puck is very maneuverable. It's got like a phase shift, two mobility spells, often buys like Yule's Blink. But if you like Blink Hex Puck, it's usually a very fragile hero, which means they'll die very quickly. So it's, it's not really a frontliner. Whereas someone like Centaur, Bristleback, fantastic example of frontliner, he just walks in the front. He's not necessarily initiating. He's just going in the front. And he's like, you want to fight us? You have to walk through me. You don't want to fight us? That's fine. I'll still stand up front. I don't care. I'll take this tower hit. I'll take like you guys poking me. I am a tanky hero, and I am just taking up space in the front because the more fragile heroes are going to be behind your frontliner, often referred to as the backline. This can be your carry, like a drow. It can be your like oracle support, who's like the save in the back. These people who, they don't want to be in the front of the fight, but someone like um, Bristleback, uh, let's see, a support, 
Ogre, Undying. These guys like to frontline because they're usually really tanky. And so it's like, yeah, go on me. I don't like I don't really care. I this is my job. It's just to be in front, to make you guys go on me. And then guess what? My counter initiating enigma will come black hole three of you. And if you don't go on me, then you're gonna have a really hard time getting to the back line. And so that's kind of their role. The healer, save. This is where most hard supports tend to fall in. Well, that's not totally true, actually. I take that back. I, I totally take that back. Um, most supports fall as a backline hero, but not always as a healer save. Healers or saves count like uh, Oracle, Dazzle, Abaddon to an extent. Um, these kind of heroes who, like we just said, they want to stand in the back, they want to heal, and when they see someone who is about to die, they are, they are either going to heal that person or they are going to literally use a saving spell like Grave or False Promise or who's another? Shadow Demon Disruption. Um, that's also technically a save. They are going to buy that hero time and save their life for at least a little bit. To do that, you need to be in the back. If you're in the front where the frontliner is, they're going to kill you first. But if you are behind the frontliner, the enemy team goes on the frontliner, you save your frontliner, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Huskar is a good example where Huskar is like a frontline type hero and you match him with someone who has a save. So that when they go on Huskar, you save him and he's like, thanks, I'm just going to keep hitting these guys for like this extra six seconds and just kill them all. Um, yeah. Damage. Hard supports, usually not in this category. Uh, again, everyone has like some overlap so obviously everyone can contribute some damage but it's not usually your primary role um, so examples carries tend to be like mainly damage what's a hard support that is unique to this and uh what am i about to say ancient apparition ancient apparitions main job is to land a good ultimate usually on a key target like alchemist or huskar where you need to cancel their regeneration ancient apparitions that is therefore his main job is damage um yeah that's kind of it really uh i can't really think of another five who i would say their main role is damage maybe snapfire to an extent again there's just it's just not usually the hard supports role i will point out so i have in here parentheses um dot's damage over time versus burst there's also single target versus aoe i suppose Again, not usually the hard supports. Well, I, I guess that's not fully true. But in terms of damage over time, this is really good to cancel blinks. Um, certain spells can't be used if you've taken damage recently, like Monkey King's Tree Dance to get into trees. So sometimes you don't have to contribute a lot of damage. You're just looking to, say, cancel a blink for like 10 seconds, as long as your damage over time lasts. Um, and then sometimes you're a burst hero like Lion who you don't want to just use that willy-nilly. You are looking to kill a target really quickly, put all the damage in before they can, say, regenerate, before they can um, pop their BKB. Like, you blink hex them, and it's like, we need to kill this guy before my two hard stuns uh, are gone, because otherwise this guy's going to BKB satanic, and then we're, we're screwed. Um, so knowing what kind of damage you have will also affect like what you're trying to do with your damage. Buffs and debuffs. This covers a pretty wide category of spells that aren't strictly damage and just like enable. So, in terms of buffs, like Ogre Magi with Bloodlust, that is an obvious buff. Um, I guess that's it. I can't think of another. Vengeful Spirit, who has like an aura, who, you know, buffs people up. Those kind of spells. Uh, for for your team that makes your team stronger and then debuffs are usually what should be on the enemy team I don't know why you would debuff your own team and I can't really think I guess Oracle can disarm her own teammate that could be a debuff I suppose but usually you are trying to debuff your enemy so someone like Shadow Demon his alt that pierces BKB that is a very strong debuff um, but this could also include like attack speed slows Movement slows. I'm not sure whether movement slow should go under a debuff or initiation. 
it doesn't really matter. Like we said, there's a lot of overlap. Um, but these are things that aren't strictly like damage or other stuff. They're just they just make the game harder, like for the enemy if you're debuffing them. So like armor reduction, magic reduction, uh anything that just makes their life more difficult. This is why slows kind of are included in there. Where some heroes hate to get slowed because then they get kited like Ursa. But then some don't really care because they are ranged or they have blinks, so it's like, uh, I don't know. So now we've covered all these categories. Again, you will often fall under several of these. But so will your teammates. And so it becomes important to recognize what is your main role. So let's take... Hmm. Who should we use? Let's take Ogre Magi. He's a very tanky guy, so he can be a frontliner. He also has one stun, so you could initiate with him. Probably not really a counter initiator, because again, you only have one stun. He does some damage with his spells. The damage over time could be... Like, it's a pretty decent cast range, so that could be a good way to cancel blinks. I might be thinking about that. He does provide a buff. But this is usually something that's quite easy to apply beforehand, so you don't really need to think about in terms of a team fight. So when a team fight breaks out, I would say his primary job is a frontliner. He provides vision and that frontline. Anyone who tries to go past him, he will stun them or slow them with uh, whatever his W is called. Uh, I'm currently forgetting. From his viewpoint in the front, he might also... We have to find out. What is it called? Ignite. There we go. Um, he might use Ignite, like he sees a Earthshaker standing in the back line waiting to come in. He goes and he ignites that guy. So now he can't blink for quite a while. Um, but I would say his main role is a frontliner. Whoever you're playing, I recommend thinking about all the things you could be. And then thinking about what is your most important job in a team fight. So like Dazzle. Dazzle can provide damage over time. He does provide some healing. And he does provide some debuffs in the in the form of armor reduction every time he casts a spell. But what is his main role? It is the save. It is the grave that he contributes. So most fights, you're not really concerned about your damage. You're not really thinking about your armor reduction. You're thinking about, I need to grave my carry, for example, at the right moment. That is my main job. The other things will be nice, but primarily, I am a save. Sometimes you may not be the save. Like if there's an axe in the game, your save suddenly loses a lot of value. And now, well, one, it's kind of a hard dazzle game, but now you might be thinking more about like, okay, maybe it'll be more useful for me to cancel blinks, to make sure I provide a lot of armor reduction. I'll just cast Grave really early and reduce their armor a lot. Um, your role kind of shifts depending on the game. If you're new to the game, I recommend someone that does not shift too much. So like Rubik is an example where he's quite complicated um, because he has a very good initiation or counter initiation spell in telekinesis. And he does provide some damage, but because he can steal spells, he is in a very unique case where he has to decide what the best spell to steal is, and often it will fit into here. So it's like, do I want to steal their big like black hole because our team needs initiation and counter initiation? Usually that's the case. But in another game, maybe there's that plus Oracle's false promise. And then it's like, wait, does our team need initiation more or a save? Um, can I get both? It, it, it gets really complicated and it can change based on the game. So if you're new to the game or feel like you're not very good at team fights, start with just one hero who is, for example, usually just a healer or just someone who saves. And then just focus on that first so you're not getting overwhelmed by everything. In terms of thinking about your team now, this is something that's going to require knowledge of every hero, at least to an extent. Um, so if you don't know what a hero does, 
then you probably don't need to be thinking too hard on this. You're at, if you don't know what every hero does, then you're at a stage where you just need to learn what every hero does. But if you know what every hero does, but maybe not necessarily what their primary role in a team fight is, think about it. This, this can be something you do in the draft phase where you see a hero and think like, when a fight breaks out, what will his main role be? Um, oh, something I, I want to mention. As an initiator, sometimes just providing vision can also count as an initiation. Um, this came to mind because I was thinking of Beastmaster's Hawk. Vision is a way to initiate. Like You need to see who you're going on. So sometimes like a bounty hunter in one of our... What did I do? I think it was the ganking video where I showed me playing bounty hunter and I just found Puck. That is a form of initiation where I am providing vision for our target. And then I think it was Nature's Prophet who did like everything else. He like silenced the puck, sprouted him, and then did all the damage. Um, so my role was just vision. But that also that can also be part of team fighting. In fact, supports can always do a bit of vision if you have ward. So it's like, oh, we need vision here. I can ward on this high ground or I can play sentries. Um, maybe vision should have been its own category here. I think, it, yeah, maybe it should have been. It's too late now. Um, but anyways, thinking about your team, the carry is usually damage. That is their main role. The mid laner often has a good amount of damage, but then is also usually either like an initiator or also like a, a frontliner. So like Puck, Puck provides damage, and Puck can both initiate or counter initiate. Dragon Knight, you know, he has damage and he's usually a frontliner um, because he's so tanky and he just like, he'll just poke away in his dragon form and if you don't go on him he's just going to slowly chip away your towers but he can also build in a way where he's an initiator um, and buy a blink or a shadow blade and start the fight with his dragon tail this is an example of a hero who, depending how they itemize, might fill different roles in a team fight which is getting to the point where you want to cover most of these categories usually to some extent. You don't always need a healer or a save. I would usually, okay, so let's start with this. I think most of the time you need one of these first three. You need an initiator and or a frontliner. And then it's nice to have a counter initiator but usually you need at least the initiator or the frontliner, someone who is going to start the fight for your team. Um, and if you don't have a counter initiator, it's kind of okay. You're just going to have to look to like win based on your initiation. It's hard. We already gave that Enigma example, where if you only have a counter initiator, it's very difficult to start. You're always waiting for the enemy team to start, which means they can always pick the fights they want. And you're not, like, you have to, what am I saying here? The enemy team gets to pick the fights they want, and your choices for fights are limited to the fights they start. Um, so they can pick like, oh, let's jump them here, let's jump them here, let's jump them here. And your options are, okay, we got jumped, do we fight or do we just run away? You know, you can never, you can never be the one to say like, oh, let us go. It, it, it's so, it's tough. So usually you can't just have a counter initiator. A healer or a save, I would say you don't always have to have this, but it can be nice. If you don't have a healer or a save on your team, usually your team will build some auras that help with this. So like Guardian Greaves will act as like a heal. Um, having a Vlad's to provide lifesteal, having a bunch of stuff that provides a lot of HP regen, like items can help to fill this category. Although for saves, usually there's not a... There's nothing as strong as some of the abilities. So... Like Dazzle's Grave, like no item can really do that for you. Aeon Disc to an extent, but that is something someone else has to buy on their own. And it's not something like you could buy to provide for someone else. Yeah, you can like glimmer them and force them. That is technically a save as well, but it's it's like a different kind of save, right? Damage. So yeah, you almost always have to have damage. If you lack damage, like how can you get kills? You can all initiate, you can all heal each other, but it's like if we don't kill this guy eventually, then they're like, what's the point? So you do have to have a good amount of damage every game. And then buffs and debuffs are another thing where it's like, technically you don't need to have them, but they're very nice to have. And they enable people to like be more effective or to disable some other people so they're not as effective. 
So every game, I like to have an initiator and or frontliner, and then you got to have damage. And then filling in those other categories will just help your team have more opportunities and be more flexible in the fights. Is that all I want to say? Oh, in terms of roles, so we said the carries, usually damage, offlaner. I like it when the offlaner is the initiator and or frontliner. Then the hard support can be like a healer slash saves slash some initiation, um, maybe damage. The four support also I like as an initiator or a frontliner. And then the mid kind of just fills in the gaps with damage or whatever. But the thing is, every hero has some possibilities. And then what items you buy will enable you to fill some of these other ones that you're lacking. That's why itemization and drafting is really important. Because some games, if you only build damage, like how are you ever going to start a fight? You know, if all your picks are about damage and healing, then you need the enemy team to start the fight. Or you need to just like literally run at them and hope they will allow you to fight. Or you will have to buy items that allow you to initiate. So like Blink and Abyssal, something for you to start the fight. Usually, you'll want to mix. Um, so now thinking about the hard support role, understand what your team has. Well, let's step back. First, understand what your hero can do based on just your spells, and then consider what items you can buy. Like, okay, I might be able to buy a Glimmer, which can act as a save. Or like, oh, my hero can buy Blink to help me be an initiator. Um, understand your options. Then you're going to see what team you have, understand what they are doing, understand what they could be doing, understand what they are actually doing. So like, even if they could be an initiator or damage, maybe they're only building for damage. This is a classic issue with offlaners in pubs, in my experience, where they all want to do damage. And then it's like, we don't have an initiator or a frontline on our team. But understand what your team... Once you have determined your job, so whether you're someone who saves, initiates, whether you are just trying to land a good ultimate like Ancient Apparition, whether you are an aura provider, whatever, we can now think about positioning and how that helps us do our job. So we know what our job is. Where do we stand? Where do we move in the fight in a way that lets us do our job? So that is literally the first point, one of only two on this. You have to do your job. <laughs> if, you, if you stand somewhere where you can't do your job, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> What's the point? If you are a Dazzle who needs to grave their carry, but you're, you're standing way in the back and you're, you're not even in range to grave, your main job, you got to be there. Once you do your job, though, you can just die. I don't care. Once your job is done, that is when you're allowed to die. So like Dazzle, he can stand back while his carry is healthy. And then as he sees the carry gets initiated on and is starting to die, he needs to move up and grave. If the carry is really fragile, then he probably has to stand close enough to grave immediately. But if his carry is really tanky, some strength core with like satanic and BKB, whatever, and he knows that my carry can die, but it'll take a bit of time, like it might take 10 seconds for them to die, then Dazzle can stand further back where it's safe. And then as he sees the carry is getting close to dying, he then moves up and casts Grave. And then if that at that point, the enemy sees Dazzle and kills Dazzle, it's like, oh, unfortunate. Like, you never want... Not, not, not totally true. Sometimes you want to die. Usually, you don't want to die. But if your job is done, then you can die. And it's okay. Sometimes you do want to die. Like, that is the asterisk disclaimer for the second point. You know, don't die until your job is done. Sometimes it is your job to die. So like Undying or Warlock with the talent. You want to cast your spells before you die. So that is part of the, the prerequisite. Even though, say, Undying is a frontliner. Like he still wants to get Tombstone down. He wants to get a couple decays off, a heal. You know, he wants to be in the area with his ult for at least a bit. But if he dies after that and like he puts up another Tombstone or like Warlock dies and the Golem comes down, then it's like was kind of what i was going for so it's like it's okay that i died and in that way you position in a way that lets you die um undying he he might just play really aggressively but keeping in mind that maybe he wants the tombstone in a particular spot when he dies he might keep that in mind 
And of course, like he doesn't want to just run out in the middle of nowhere and die. You want to stay in a, a useful area for your team so that, say, you have two tombstones near each other, uh, making it very difficult difficult for the enemy to fight. That is part of positioning, understanding where you need to be for your job to be done, but also in a way that your team can still fight, like even after you die. Another case I'm going to point out for when it's okay to die as part of your job, this is something VP, Virtus Pro, um, Solo, the captain, the hard support, he is particularly well known for doing this, where he will, it'll be in a stalemate where the teams are looking for Roche, and then it'll look like he's out of position, and the enemy teams will commit something to kill him, and he will immediately buy back and teleport to the fight that his team has now taken. Um, and so in a way, he baits his death. Um, this is something I, I probably wouldn't recommend in pubs, but is an example of when you might die like as part of your job another example is breaking smokes you want to stand like if you're not sure where the enemy is and you are able to die so you have buyback or your cooldown or your death timer is not that long um and like your carry cannot die they use buyback recently or something in that case you usually want to stand near a cliff to try to break smokes as people say approach the high ground um and then you die for your carry, and your carry has as much time as possible to get out. That is another case where dying is okay. But that's positioning as a whole. I guess it is still connected to team fights, because like in the case of Solo, he is baiting his death to start a team fight. And in uh in the smoke example, you are dying to avoid a team fight. That is something I didn't strictly say before, but we can go back to it real quick. If you look at these roles. Sometimes when a team like has everything, they have an initiator and a counter initiator, and one of them functions the frontliner. They have like a support that saves and buffs the mid and the carry. They do a lot of damage. That is a very scary team, one that is very good at team fights. And if your team is not good, like you have straight damage and maybe a save, but that means like you really can't start fights. And like maybe you have one guy with a stun, but that's like not enough to compete with two team fighting stuns, you know? Um, in that case, you want to avoid team fights and maybe look for small pickoffs. And you have to realize then that, okay, with the team fight roles we have, we are not looking for a big five on five fight. We are looking for little fights, like three on two. Or like part of the reason that enemy's team fight was so good is they have two initiators. So if one of them is not there, then maybe we can take that fight. Understanding what makes the enemy team fight so good, what makes your own team fight so good or bad, like understanding which part is critical to it is a, a big part of understanding what team fights to take or not to take or how to set up a team fight. Like after you kill the enemy carry so that now they have no damage, now it's like, now we can fight. Like who cares if they initiate and counter initiate on us? They don't have the damage to win the fight. Um understanding when you take away a key component like how that ruins a team fight that is that's team fighting i guess really um the most common example i can think of is when there's a save a save tends to be a critical part of a team fight so like dazzle or oracle and like let's say you're playing oracle then a big part of your game plan for your team is like if you have a death prophet who really depends on saving, uh, on being saved, and she ults and she wants to run into the fight, and then if they waste time on her, you save her, and then in the time she is saved, she has killed several people, and even if she dies after, it's like whatever. If you just kill Oracle first, death prophet cannot play like that. She cannot be aggressive. If she is ulted, she just has to leave, and it's a huge waste. Um, the save from Oracle is what enables the entire team fight. And so the enemy team should recognize that, and they are looking to kill Oracle. Without Oracle, your team just can't do anything. Sometimes the Oracle doesn't matter. Like, say it's not Death Prophet. Say it's like a Dragonite, your other carry is pretty tanky, you have initiators. So it's like your save is helpful, but it, it does not define your team's ability to do things. In that case, it like 
you don't really care about killing Oracle first. You probably still do. You almost always want to kill the saves first. But so maybe that wasn't the best example. But I hope that shows how like you need to identify what makes a team fight good. And it's different for every team. Like sometimes you take out the initiator, sometimes you take out the damage. Sometimes you take out the save. Like sometimes you usually don't kill the frontliner. The frontliner is almost always bait. It's it's like their job. They they trick you. They make you think you have to go on them, but you really don't want to. Um, that is nearly the universal rule, but sometimes the frontliner can go out of position in a way that it's okay. A common example of that is a timber saw who pops off in the laning stage and they think they're unkillable, so then they start diving between like tier two and tier three towers. But then four people kill that timber saw, and he's like, "I thought I couldn't die," you know. He was trying to do this frontlining thing, but it was like too much. So sometimes frontliners can go out of position and die, but they're usually a bait. Um, going back to positioning, though. Actually, we're gonna head into a custom lobby. Let me let me demonstrate how this applies item wise. What I wanted to show here is different types of positioning based on the heroes in the game. Um, and again, we won't cover every single example, but I think we have two major ones right here. So let's say you're a Dazzle. You got to protect your Drow with Grave. Right now, it's only level one, so it's quite short range. You have to be, you know, somewhat close to her. Let's ignore Storm Spirit first. Let's say he's not in this game. The enemy has a Slardar as their initiator. What does that mean for my positioning? If we think about how close I need to be to Drow in order to cast Shallow Grave, right here works. And again, I could be here. I could be over here. But what's the difference between these three different spots? Well, if I'm near Drow, then he can just blink on top of us, stun both of us. And depending on how many stuns they have, perhaps they could just chain stun and kill both of us before I can do anything. Um, Perhaps someone else stuns me or silences me and then kills Drow before I get to cast Grave. Or, because we're both right here, maybe they'll focus me and then they'll switch to Drow. What if I stand here? Now I'm farther away, so they can't blink on top of both of us. You know, in between... <laughs> His stun is quite large, so he may not have been the best example. You know what, let's say we have a couple more points in Grave and I'm, uh, I'm now further away. Now we can't be hit by Slardar. Um... Actually, let's move this way a bit so we're both in range. So let's say Drow's hitting him here. Don't actually do it, though. And I'm over here. And they're deciding, oh, who do we go on? The issue with this is that even though I am far from Drow, he can still blink on me. He could have also blinked on Drow. He has the choice to initiate on either of us. And he should choose me because I am the one who keeps Drow alive with Grave. But if we go back to this issue where, or this position where I'm over here, how can he get to me? If he tries to run up, Drow will hit him and then he can't blink. Now he has no choice but to go on Drow. If he wants to go on me, say Drow's hitting this tower, say we have vision, maybe we have a ward down. Um, and in fact, you know, we could place one so we could see him. I have all vision on so that we don't lose track of these enemy heroes. So it's a little harder to envision. Let's say he realizes, I cannot blink this way to get to Drow. But I know that Dazzle is back here. Now I must run around, you know. And now I can blink on Dazzle. See, by running around, it's now similar to when he was standing here and I was standing here. What this means is, this is good for Slarder. He can now initiate on me, but it couldn't come from this direction. But he has repositioned to now get to me. I have to recognize that as the hard support playing a save who, you know, needs to stay alive. I need to now shift over this way. Like once Slardar disappears, this is why it's good to have vision in a team fight. If I know he's going this way for whatever reason, maybe he's tracked. We have a bounty hunter on our team and I see him going that way. Then as soon as he starts walking this way, I would start walking this way. I want to keep Drow in between me and Slardar. I want the person I am saving like, I need to be within a certain range. I need to be, like, in this circle around Drow. And where I stand there, I want to be as far away from the initiator as possible. So I keep it between us. And if this guy, like, ends up coming all the way back here, then obviously I can't, like, go over here because now I'm on the front line where the rest of the, the enemy team would be. But you know what? If he tries to do that, he is now starting to reach a point where maybe he's out of position, where he is too far from his team. 
Um, because if he still chooses to initiate on me, like let's say I'm over here and he chooses to initiate on me over here, this is a bit awkward for our team. But as soon as we see Slardar like moving all the way, we could have chosen to just back up or we could have repositioned in a way where we go on him first real quick, where like we had an initiator who jumps on him and then Drow quickly goes on him. Um, this is all how... These are all different ways we can think about positioning in the fight so that I am able to grave Drow as needed, but I am staying away from initiators and people who might burst and kill me. Now, in this example, I had to position in a way because Slardar... We're imagining that Slardar knew where I was. So maybe he had... Maybe he casted this on me earlier so he knows where I am and he's looking for me. Oh, actually, this is a bad example because now hiding doesn't matter. Um, what's a different case? I don't know. Let's say they don't have vision of me, but they know to look for me. And let's say they have... You know what? Slaughter does have good night vision, so maybe just standing out here is not enough. In which case, this is where going into trees can be very good, um, so they don't know where you are. Like, even if they have someone who pushes up here and Drow has to back up a little, this guy still doesn't know where I am. And he has a blink. Technically, I am in range, but it would be weird for him to just suddenly blink in here and stun. Um if I have not given my position away. So this is another aspect of positioning. Hiding so that even though I am technically in range, they don't know I am in range. You do have to be careful when you use trees. You have to consider the pathing that you may get stuck in. For example, if Drow is here, pretend I don't have a blink dagger. You know, usually I would just be able to, like if, if it was over here and I was just positioning further away, Usually, I can just walk up and grave her. But because of these trees where they are, I can't walk here, which means I have to go all the way around and then come over here. So you do have to be careful, keeping in mind that first point. I have to be close enough to do my job. If I stay in trees, this is helping me to stay alive, but I may not be able to do my job if like this is still low level and I can't actually grave from out of, from out of here. This now brings us to our next point. How do items help us? Now we can think about Storm Spirit, who zips around. And so that, remember with Slardar, I positioned over here so that Blink can't reach me and that Drow would cancel his Blink before he could get in range. That doesn't work for Storm, right? If I'm back here, Storm can get to me if he wants. Gets over here and attacks me. So positioning just far back will not work. And in fact, even if I'm all the way over here, Storm could zip onto me and kill me. So now I... Either A, I have to use trees so that Storm doesn't know where I am. And even though I am in range, like he doesn't know I'm in range, so we can't just zip over here. Or I have to position, let's say I have, of course I have heroes on my team besides Drow. And so I have to position somewhere where it's too dangerous for him to come to. So like I have an initiator um, next to me. So if he, if he zips to me, our OD with the scythe is just going to hex him immediately and... We're probably going to kill him before I die. Um, that is a way I position to be safe around my teammates. Or this is where items start to come in. Because ignoring my teammates, right? Because I cannot position in a way that keeps me safe, I, I can't fulfill both. I cannot stay near enough to drow and still not be at risk of dying from the storm just sipping on me. Because sometimes, yeah, th there are trees here, but there are going to be other times we fight where I'm not going to be able to hide in trees. Like a fight breaks out here and the enemy team has full vision of me or something. Um, or like, say, Slardar does use his ult on me and the enemy is always going to know where I am. Like, there's no way I could possibly hide for Storm to not just zip on me and kill me. In this situation, this is where items start to come into play. And I need to buy things to keep me safe. So I could buy, like, a... Oops. I could buy a Glimmer, which, you know, doesn't work against Corrosive Haze, but, you know, against just Storm Spirit, if he doesn't have slots for detection, he tries to zip on me, and I Glimmer, and I, now I am in a position, I'm still fulfilling both, where I am in a position, I can save Drow, and this Glimmer allows me to finish up the second part of our positioning goals of not dying. So I'm in range, but I'm not going to die here because I Glimmer to safety. Other examples could be like... Um, Ghost Scepter, where I am now. I, I don't know why I swapped spots. I didn't really need to. He can come on me, but I will Glimmer, or I will E. 
I will go Scepter. I will go Ethereal. And Storm Spirit, he does have spells, so he can still do damage to me. But he probably won't kill me if he can't auto-attack me. Um, besides Storm Spirit, Phantom Assassin might be a better example. Any, like, right-clicking core. Sven, who might blink, stun me, and then try to burst me in that time. Like, if I can go Scepter first, he can't kill me. And this will give me a bit more time to cast Grave on Drow first, or for Drow to react, kill this guy. Um, something to happen where I'm not going to die immediately. That's the most important part. And so now I am positioning in a way that lets me Grave Drow, and my items have made up for the fact that I was not able to complete the second objective of staying alive via positioning. Sometimes you can just position in a way that keeps you alive, and other times you cannot. Now, another... Another way this might work is if I had, say, a, nope, a four staff. Now I can position just further back. So, Slardar example could work where he's coming from the side. And even now, I'm still too far back. So, he decides, okay, I'll go on Drow. We'll kill her. But you know what? Even though I was so far back and I'm not within grave range, I force up and I can grave her. And now it works out. Um, so the item allows me to position where I will not die, being really far back, but the item lets me get into range to perform my job like I needed to do. So it helps me complete the first objective of making sure I can do my job. Other items that do this could be like, uh, Aether Lens, which just extends the range of your spells. A Blink, for example, it's pretty uncommon on position fives, but... Like Oracle, I think is a can be a decent blink builder where it's like I have to be in range to alt people, but I'm just getting killed because there's like storms, there's you know blinks galore, PAs, whatever. I have to position so far back, and then when my drow needs me, I blink in and I grave, and then I like I immediately run away probably where it's like oh please don't kill me, you know. Or now that I've blinked in. I have some items to help me stay alive, and then maybe I'll be alive long enough to cast Grave again, you know, with my ult, and then this is pretty low cooldown at a max level. That's kind of all I wanted to say about positioning. Oh, yeah, let me demonstrate what I was saying earlier about positioning and ways to break smokes. Um, usually you don't smoke at night, but... Oh, no. Okay, so if the enemy was, oops, if the enemy was smoked up, so this enemy is here, the difference between positioning here and positioning, say, here, especially at night, is that, oh, is this going to work? Hold on, I need, let's do this. Even if you have vision, so this guy smokes up, his smoke does not break till here. It is only a short distance for him to finish coming up high ground and now to see what is going on. Sees me, blinks, and gets me. Or he might see... Where's my drow? Or he might see my drow farming. Let's say he was farming here. So he comes up... Oops. His smoke breaks here. He finishes coming up high ground, sees the two of us. Let's say I'm not a dazzle. Let's say I'm uh, like an ogre magi who can't really save so then he goes immediately on my core kills my core because i can't do anything but what if instead i positioned right at the edge where now his smoke breaks here and this is such a long range he knows that because smoke broke i'm probably around here so he could blink up here but it's a bit scary he has no idea what else is up here and I might see him. So especially if it's daytime, I will see him here and I immediately know to react. Drow immediately knows to react. We both start getting away. Um, whereas the case where I'm standing here and smoke doesn't break till here, like again, he could know, okay, smoke just broke. So it's probably like in this range. He could blind blink if he wanted to, but it's like much safer for him to come up high ground and then see. Um, and even then it's not the best. He doesn't love having to come up high ground. Worse would be if I was like positioned over here. Like, I was thinking, oh, I should stay in range of Drow to protect her, and I'll stay out of sight. But this is actually bad, because he comes up here, smoke breaks now, and he sees Drow, and he goes. Maybe he doesn't see me. Um, his stun would still hit me, though. 
And if I gray from there, it's like... At that point, it doesn't matter. The fight has already started, and that's where it's, like, not good. Um, but by positioning in ways where you break smokes as soon as possible, this gives the most time for your carry to get out and for you to react. They might still kill you and go on you here, especially if they're winning and they're, like, really far ahead. But that's all the more reason you need to position in a, in a way like this so that Drow can get away. And there are common examples. Sometimes you can combine it, right? Where, like, you'll position up here so that this guy smokes runs up here he doesn't know he's not sure it's like are you here are you here maybe they're really strong so they blink up anyways and then they don't see you because you're behind trees and he's like i'm so confused who like where is he and then maybe you can tp out immediately maybe you have a, a glimmer to hide and tp out something like that um this is a way where you combine both a position that breaks smokes and trying to stay like out of sight um, but in a way that you could see the smoke break. Like sometimes, like if you break a smoke and you don't know you broke it, then it's like, it's good, but you can't react to it. So you usually need to be in a position where you can see. This is when combining wards can be really good. So like you can stand here and usually without this ward, like if I, uh, whoops, totally off. So I don't actually have vision here, right? That means if Slardar were to smoke and then run up here, his smoke breaks here. He knows it. He knows that his smoke is broken. And so that someone is like in this vicinity. But I have no idea that I just broke a smoke. This, oh, I don't have a... This is when you can combine observers um, with this kind of positioning. So like you stand over here and anyone that smokes this way, Usually, you wouldn't know, but now with the ward, you do. And now you can be like, oh, man, time to get out of here. That guy just appeared out of smoke. Um, and this guy still has to guess. He's like, uh, maybe they're here. Or maybe they're here. You know, odds are he would guess this area is my bet. But yeah, I, this may not seem like team fighting, but this is like preemptive team fighting. This is like setting up the team fight. You know, not letting Slardar jump you and start the team fight the way he wants to. So we are going to include it here. After all, it's called team fighting and positioning. And part of this is positioning. Um, positioning is hard. Honestly, it's in the large scale, it can seem easy. Like what I explained here seems easy. It's like, oh, we stand instead of standing next to Drow, we stand further back. That is something that people do make the mistake of. Sometimes they get all excited and they want to be up here and hit the tower too. So I will say like, if that is what you've done, then now, you know, be a little safer. You do like no damage compared to Drow who has like a bunch of damage and attack speed and stuff you like your damage on towers doesn't matter remember your job your job is not to damage towers it's to save drow and position in a way to do such but for people that do already have that general sense of knowing like oh i need to save drow it's very difficult to know like over here where overall you're in the right spot like if they're coming from this um will be a good example like okay let's say a fight is breaking out this way the enemy team is coming this way your carry is like here and you're here or let's let's move up a little bit and you're like over here it's very difficult to realize that this positioning might be slightly worse than this positioning this is like a matter of a few hundred units it's probably like a hundred it's probably 200 actually um where it's very difficult to be self-aware of that or that running this way to drow would be worse than running over here and keeping this like tree in between you these small positioning things are very difficult to keep in mind, especially as like a team fight is breaking out. Um, but it does make a pretty big difference. Um, in in pro games, like sometimes people get really hyped about the small plays people do. That can often be a direct result of like positioning. Like if Slardar was chasing me, and instead of just like running straight, it is like cutting what am i doing <laughs> so instead of running straight it's like cutting around trees it's trying to break vision instead of just like running in a straight line you know running in a circle around a tree to like waste people time like oh it's because he has all vision i think it didn't work um actually i have no idea why uh, custom lobbies are weird but like trying to buy time like running through trees stopping and stuff um like blocking paths like this these are all very minuscule tricks that 
are something some of you can start implementing. But if you're at a lower level, don't worry about it too much. Like if, for example, in the past you were... If in the past you were, like, excited to hit towers with drow, pretend you had creeps here so you were stepping up. Like, the major picture is to know not to do that and to stand back here. And then eventually it's to learn, like, standing here is much better than standing here. Um, so depending how good you are at this stuff, like keep that in mind, like first learn to just be farther back, like be in a position where he will have a hard time running past your out to get to you. And then after that, learn to incorporate, you know, being smoked up, being invis, being ready to force staff, like being back here and forcing forwards or knowing that you have a force staff so that even though drow is like over here, it's fine. And you will just force staff in and grave her. Start with the big picture, work smaller. Think about where you can position position to do your job and go from there. Dazzle was a save. So what is another example? Ogre as a frontliner? No, I want to use someone else. Vengeful Spirit, who maybe you'll build auras on, right? So you want to do something similar where you're like Dazzle because you have a you have the swap, which can be used defensively. So you still want to position back, but you can't really do what dazzle does in terms of like staying way far back because now your auras aren't really doing anything unless your swap is that important where the aura doesn't matter you just need to save them that's when you might position really far back as vengeful spirit but oftentimes as vengeful spirit the aura is a big part of why you picked the hero why you may have built some aura items as well and so if you're standing too far back you're staying safe to use your swap but your auras are going to waste and that's why you would then Keep that in mind in terms of positioning. So let's say I'm Venge right now. I would want to stay like nearest Drow so that my aura, um, any items I have, they still affect Drow. They still affect my team. Like if I had another team member, um, this is going to create Dragonite. It is. Let's say I had a Dragonite, right? Would I want to position here where only Drow is in range of my auras? Or I want to try to position over here where now they're both in range of my auras. Here is better for the auras. And this is where you'll usually want to be. But again, keep in mind, like, what is the important part of me? Is it the auras or is it my save? If it's my save and it is going to be specifically used for drow, then yeah, maybe positioning over here where drow is in range of the aura and your save. And even though this guy is not in the aura, like you remembered, my primary job is to swap drow out. So I don't care so much about getting my aura to everyone. But if you're really crushing the game and it's like, I'm not really going to need to swap to save my teammates, then your primary job becomes providing that aura and you want to stay in range of as many teammates as possible. We are going to do at least one example here to break down how a team fight can go. Um, maybe we'll do another. Let's see how long this one takes. But in this game, I'm actually offlane Venomancer, but it's okay because we're just thinking about team fighting as a whole dynamic right now. And we can look at the perspective of the hard supports later. But really to me, team fighting is this huge topic where even though this is a hard support guide and I'm going to recommend to you like know what the, your hard support does in a team fight when you're thinking about team fights you need to think from the team's perspective um and so that's why this has not been so focused specifically on hard supports it's been like a very general approach but when you start to understand the game a lot understand what every hero can do what their options potentially are and what items they can potentially buy to, you know, fill different roles. You can predict how team fights will go. This is what casters do, analysts do at the, uh, you know, if you watch a pro game and they're saying like, well, I think this team will like be very strong in fights. It's because once you can understand what heroes do, you can predict all this. So let's look at our team. I'm the offlaner. Bane was a five. He wanted to play with Spectre. Venomancer is the only offlane I can play. And the way you play off uh, Venomancer is as a, a front liner. So my role in a team fight, let's uh, pull up this uh, roles real quick again. So we have initiator, counter initiator. I am blocking the last one. You'll, you'll know. Initiator, counter initiator, front liner, heals and saves, damage, buffs and debuffs. So I am a front liner who provides damage over time and a lot of it and buffs and debuffs to an extent because i'll buy auras and i'll debuff the enemy with slows and in this game like i buy a uh, spirit vessel um i think i also buy a pipe to buff up my team make them stronger who's our counter initiator here 
It is Phoenix. We said he doesn't want to initiate. That's okay. I'm the frontliner. I force the issue. If they never want to come to me, then it's fine. My, my wards will just take the tower. So they have to run into me. And when they do that, then Phoenix can counter initiate. Bane. Bane is a... He can be an initiator because of his Fiend's Grip, his ultimate, very strong. Nightmare can also be a setup. Um, that tends to be more on a, in a pick-off sense. Um, in terms of a team fight, he usually disables one key target, usually someone very elusive. Um, but he can also act as a save with Nightmare. He can save a teammate for that like one second, dodge a spell. Or he can use it to... Um, when the enemy has someone who dives backlines, you can Nightmare that guy and then just leave that... Um, avoid it. He also debuffs the enemies with this stuff a little. Ember Spirit, very flexible hero. Um, kind of like Void Spirit. This is actually a... I like this game a lot as a way to compare and contrast. Both Ember Spirit and Void Spirit are very free, versatile heroes. They can be straight up damage. They can initiate very well. They could technically be a counter initiator. Um, they usually like to kill backlines, but they can focus like whoever their team is focusing. In general, they just want to be able to do whatever they want to do. That is what makes these heroes good. And if you force them into a specific role, sometimes they can fill it, but sometimes it's not really what they want to do. I would say Ember Spirit is very free in this game because I am the frontliner. We got our counter initiator here. We have our save and another form of initiation. So like between the three of us, we already have very good team fights. We are lacking a bit of um, burst damage um, because right now we're like mainly damage over time, but we provide a good amount of damage over time. And that's why Ember is so free. He can choose to start the fight with us. Like even though I'm frontlining, if someone walks out of position, he can remnant in, sleight of fist them um, and change them. Um, so he could be initiation. He could wait for them to go on me, and then he can go on the back line or help me at the front line. Either way, he can do whatever he wants. Whatever he sees, uh, however the fight is breaking out, he can do whatever. And Spectre is just going to farm for the most part, and when she does decide to contribute, she's going to alt in and just provide damage generally. Um, especially to go on back line targets, but Spectre, Spectre in terms of team fights, especially the early to mid games, she just tends to be damaged. She ults in, does the fight, and then leaves. If you look at the enemy team, they don't have as good of a draft in terms of team fighting. Sometimes that's okay. I'm not going to say like just because your team can't team fight, you've lost. Um, but in terms of pub Dota, oftentimes it does end up into like ultimately like a 5v5 kind of thing. And so having a good team fight is usually very helpful. And because team fighting is a little easier to understand rather than like a heavy pickoff lineup, which is what this team needs to be, a late game, mid to late game pickoff lineup. But even then they can't really do that. Um, that's why this draft is like really messy to me. Because if we look at it first, who's their frontliner? No one. Like he doesn't really want a frontline. He doesn't want a frontline. You want your carry to frontline. Some carries can, but Ricky wants to jump around and do what he wants. So first, no frontliner. Initiator, sort of, no one that good. Like he can find out a target and then, you know, use a diffusal smoke cloud them. But in terms of a hard stun, his is very difficult to land. He's not an initiator. Nature's Prophet can eventually buy like Orchid and Scythe of Ice, but that is not in the early game. It's like mid to late game. And so that means at the start, like what can they do? Sniper. This is his biggest weakness. Until he buys Aghanims, it's very hard to contribute to a fight in terms of initiation. All you do is provide damage, which is usually not what supports do. That's why it's like weird to... Um, I think people are not fully used to sniper support. All he does is provide damage, some vision with his shrapnel, and it, like, it is a good slow and zoning tool, but who will start the fight if you have a sniper for It has to be your offlaner or your mid or like someone usually and he is not going to start fights he can right we just talked about how ember spirit and void are very flexible heroes but i also said you don't want to force them into a role and now he is forced into a role where he has to initiate because otherwise who will witch doctor 
Witch Doctor's going to walk in and throw his cask at Ember Spirit? That's not going to work. So he has to jump in, and he has to land a very difficult... It's much easier for Ember Spirit to initiate, um, because Aether Remnant is very hard to land on your own um, without setup. But if you use, like, a Yule's Dagger... Or, I'm sorry, a Yule Scepter to set up a Remnant, then that was also your own save. So you have now, you know, used one ult to step in. You've used your defensive item to be aggressive. And so unless this really works out, you're kind of screwed. You're in a really bad spot. If we think about damage, yeah, they've got damage. I'll give them that. They're, they like That's all they have, really, to me. Buffs? No one buffs each other, really. You can buy some items, I guess. Debuffs? Maledict is really annoying. Smoke Cloud? Sure. But, like, you see what I mean? This one just doesn't fill as many of the teamfight requirements to me. And as a result, they have to avoid teamfights. They have to look for pickoffs. And after they all have items, they are quite scary. When this guy has an Agonims, he can now initiate. But that's not going to... Look, this game ended in 24 minutes. This was kind of a stomp. Um, but even if that had been a fair lineup, like he's not going to be able to initiate until like 25 minutes when he gets Ags. And at that point, it is kind of good um, to set up with a lot of these guys. But you are waiting 25 minutes before you can make plays. And that is usually a very bad thing. Look, look how soon we can make plays. As soon as I'm strong enough to force fights, which is like level five, like we're pretty, we're ready to go. Other times when you have like a centaur, a slardar, any, as soon as they get a blink, they're ready to go. And that can be as early as like 15 minutes. Obviously it can be way sooner, but like as an average time, I would say around 15 minutes, they're ready to make plays. And this team can't make a play until 25 when he has ags and he has to be there to start that fight. That is an issue. So, now, let's go look at one team fight in this and see how it goes. Okay, so here we are, and we're forcing fights. So let's take a look real quick. I want to be the front liner, so I am dropping, you know, I'm dropping a lot of wards, spreading them out a bit to uh, help cover more area, make it difficult for these guys to approach. Phoenix is going to stay a little bit back to um, be ready to counter-initiate because... You know, Phoenix has dive, so they don't need to be that close. Ember Spirit is doing really well this game, so he feels totally fine to run up this close. I don't think he needs to be. Like, I think I could just be the one forcing it. And if this game was closer, I think that's what should happen. So look, this guy has to initiate, right? And he can just walk out of it. Who cares? And then this is why I'm such a good frontliner. I hit everyone with a slow and a big ult. This guy has used a lot of his burst on me. I'm not even going to die this game. Bane now TP's in. Spectre has ulted to provide damage. Now the counter initiation where this guy has committed on me, the frontliner, baited this guy in. What does this guy have left? He has no ult. He has no spells. He is stuck all the way over here. These guys tried to go in. In fact, let's go back a little. Um, so here he's going away. Sniper's ulting, like can't contribute that much. They're trying to go on Phoenix which is when Spectre comes in, and now this guy counter-initiates. So in this case, they were also baited to go on this guy, which I think is a mistake, because Phoenix... Like, there's no way they kill him before Phoenix can ult. So to me, that's a mistake to go on Phoenix. Um, and so because of that, Phoenix gets to ult, have a really nice fight. This guy, you saw him nightmare him a little bit. We have to chase him for a while. But, like, look how well that team fight went for us. Part of it is because we are just ahead. But part of the reason we're ahead is because we have a better draft. And, like, before this time, like, I was pressuring top by myself because they couldn't really do anything. Um, we took several other smaller fights that were just way easier for us to take than for them. And this was our first, like, full major team fight. And I think you saw how it went, where these guys, like, Ricky and Void kind of had to initiate. And it was just, like, super weak because it's not good. Void ended up choosing to go on me, the frontliner, and I was like totally happy with that. I was like, yeah, go on me. My Ember's going to be free. You're not going to focus him. Like he was in Smoke Cloud and you want to go on me. That's fine. Now this this guy has a great ult because you chased me so far. He was coming in if he had needed to like do anything, but he like ended up not really needing to do much. Uh, this game ends up being a stomp and it ends in 10 minutes. So I think we can do one more quick analysis. Let's go look at that. Here's one more example we're going to cover. And in this game, I think both drafts could win. 
but due to our itemization there are many there's several reasons why we lost but i think itemization is a big one and we're going to see how that applies in team fighting here so let's start with the radiant team they have a pretty good lineup in my opinion so life stealer and underlord are very good at being frontline heroes so they can just force a fight they can just walk up because they're so tanky and survivable and if we don't engage then they're just going to take objectives so we're required to engage or do something to split push and trade for example but they are going to force objectives and we have to respond now pangolier is a very flexible hero he can um he can initiate but he can also counter initiate um, and in this game because he has these frontliners who can just force objectives without him initiating he doesn't have to initiate and he'll just counter initiate that makes it pretty easy for him. He just sits back and watches. And when we go on his very survivable heroes, then he goes in. Ogre, another frontlining hero who also enables Lifestealer. So in this case, because he already has two other frontliners, Ogre doesn't have to run to the front necessarily. He can be more to the back and look for stuns um, because his team doesn't really have too many reliable stuns. Like I know his ult and stun but it's it can be a little hard to land same with arrow this is a root so his stun is the only like really reliable one and so because he has underlord to front line he can stay instead of being in the front he can be a little further back not like a back liner but you know behind the front line and then he can just stun anyone who walks up to fight his front liners or if someone tries to jump to the back he can stun them so he can play this like middle ground marana does not like to be the only initiator. When your only way to start a fight is to land an arrow, it is so hard because you're just, you have to wait for an arrow to land, and that is so difficult. But with Marana in this game, she has frontliners to force objectives, which means she just sits back, fires an arrow, and if it misses, it's like, whatever, who cares? And if it hits, then it's like, oh, we can actually go on that. Let's go fight. Um, and because these guys will just start the. Like, they'll just start pushing without her. She just gets to sit back and it's like, okay, now when I'm needed, now I'll fire an arrow. It's fine. I don't need to do, I don't need to do much. If you look at our draft, theoretically, it could be okay. We have an offlane DK and a carry Slark mid puck. Um, these heroes are a bit flexible, where puck is usually an initiator. And in this game, I think... Puck should be an initiator. Dragonite was actually our example earlier, so that actually worked out, where he can initiate, or he could be like a frontliner, or a, uh, like, usually doesn't build damage, but he can, like, build more auras to be this mix of frontline and, like, buffing up teammates. Because we have Puck to initiate, I think that's what he should have done. He should have built auras, he should have built stuff to just be in the frontline and buff up our team. But instead, he also built to be an initiator. And so when fights would break out, we had two ways to initiate and no damage. And we weren't very tanky. Um, and we weren't very, like, survivable, I mean, as a team because he didn't build auras. Um, like, Rubik and Jakiro. Like, Jakiro is not really an initiator because he's so slow. He can from Fog, but... In this game against their lineup, I just kind of wait for my team to start something, and then I land an ice path to follow up when the enemy is all grouped up, which is harder this game because like he has rage and this guy's got his ultimate. So ice path was hard to use this game. Macro pyre is pretty good. Like after he hopefully dream coils several heroes, that's where I macro pyre and hopefully get like some damage in. And then I like I try to pro provide slows, but again the Immunity makes it kind of a tough game for Jakiro. Rubik. I think Rubik, against this game, it's hard. I think he's looking to steal, like, Roll or Firestorm, maybe Arrow. Um, something to help deal with the frontliners, because, again, we talked about how they can just force the issue, and it's hard for us to necessarily do anything. But if he steals Firestorm, he can just drop it there, and both of these strength heroes are really going to suffer under Firestorm. Um, but then he also has his stun to help provide some lockdown, so he needs to be somewhat close. 
but then again it's kind of weird because like this guy's initiating this guy's initiating this guy could have like lifted people but we're lacking damage against this very strong like tanky lineup and then slark should have been this is why i think it should have been okay like usually slark can just he enjoys longer fights where he slowly gets to steal a lot of damage and i think he's pretty survivable this game except for the fact that they have like a lot of aoe stuns like his stun his root and then followed up by arrow and he really needed a bkb but he built ghost blade or shadow blade after defusal and so i like i don't think he was able to man fight and because of that he had to like play very like in and out which means none of us have damage and so it's very hard to start a fight this game um so now we're gonna go look at an example where they can just force an objective and like we can't do that much about it here we are this team is going to push high ground we are losing at this point as you can see we're a bit down and uh they just got roshan we're gonna see why this is hard to fight with the uh the items can i show them yeah so with the items they have where underlord knows he's the frontliner and so he's been buying aura items to help pango he's pretty free so he's just building kind of whatever he wants and it, it's like providing damage and his ult is providing the counter initiation this guy knows he's the damage and the frontliner, so he's building items that allow him to just force objectives and be difficult to kill. He, Ogre, is buffing up his lifestealer, like a medallion and the bloodlust. And then Marana, like her items are... <laughs> she could do whatever this game. Uh, because a lot of the rest is covered and all she does has to do is fire arrows. So I like that she has... I'm okay with arcane boots because as long as her team has mana, like the health is fine. They can all lifesteal and have high regen, and this guy will heal them too. So it's like, we just need mana on this team, and we can like infinitely push. Um, whereas if you look here, like because of the Ghost Shadow Blade, he's good for pickoffs, but this team has just been grouped up a lot, because that's what they're good at. They're not going to be separated to get pickoffs. And so he needs a BKB so that he can man fight some of these guys. And because he doesn't have it, he can't do that. Dragonite has a blink, and... Like, the rest of the items aren't that tanky. So it's like, he can start a fight, but we don't have the damage to kill anyone. Puck, rushing Ags, Blink and Ags. I actually think that's okay this game because he has Rage and this guy has the ult. And I, I, like, I'm okay with Puck building like that, but then that means we need damage from somewhere else and we need, like, utility from somewhere else. Um, so I think Slark needs to be the damage with the BKB and then combined with, like, my spells and whatever Jakiro can use. And then he needs to be, like, this frontliner who can take up, like, when these guys try to force an objective, he can be up front, like, fighting them a little bit, um, baiting them in so that Puck can land a good ult. The but because we're lacking all that, like, you see, we try to stall it out a little bit, and now we have to... I have to be really far back, because I can die really easily this game. I'm kind of poor, because uh, we weren't doing so well, and so it's like, if he gets on me, I'm definitely dead. If this guy gets on me, if he chose to go on me, I'm probably dead. I really can't do that much. I'm just trying to stall things out. Maybe this guy's walking a little too far forward, I think. But maybe... I don't know if he already had rage. Like, see how they can back up? Like, these two are kind of the front line. He's waiting to counter-initiate. She's just launching arrows. They don't necessarily have anyone who's, like, a save this game. Um, so... If they did, like a Dazzle or an Oracle, they'd be back here. But like this positioning overall is pretty good. Ours is kind of awkward where he like needs to initiate. So he should be the one a little further up, I think. And like, I, I'm not sure why I came so far forward, to be honest. I think I should also be a little back. Um, Slark's trying to go in, but like, again, because he didn't have the BKB, he can't fight. DK's not here yet. And now see he can just kill this is the issue with being a support right he come in too close and he'll just kill you and you're gonna see me die next soon um and like back here they're trying to fight but like they just have no damage like there i can't do anything i was trying to ult because i saw them dream coiled in the back but it's like if slark can't fight them just my ult is not enough to do damage and so it's like you know, they decide to back out. I don't think they really needed to. I think they could have just spent some time healing. Uh, so technically we hold. But part of that is because they dove really far. 
And they should have just been hitting this tower. If they had just hit this tower, it would have been a lot better. They did get a buyback, though. And, like, two kills like that. This guy's going to die. I don't think he needed to. He he should have swash He swashbuckled up away, but he should have just gone to the Underlord. That's a miscommunication on their part. So, in my opinion, this guy shouldn't have died. And so, only Ogre should have died, which is, like, whatever. The five-position Ogre. That is his job to die. And they got uh, two kills on us. The buyback. Could have gotten this tower. I think they could have played it out better. But I don't know. I, I hope that just shows like how hard team fighting was without the right items. So like even though I think if we pull up uh if we pull this up again and move my camera. Like even though we had I think between the lineup we had, we could have had all of these, but we didn't buy the items that make it possible. Like we lose damage if Slark's not BKB'd to auto attack. And like we have too many initiators, so we have no frontliner. Like DK is supposed to be our frontliner there. Um I don't think DK was like the greatest pick, but like DK can do it. I've seen it happen, offline DKs. But when you buy a blink which has no stats against this lineup, which has magic damage that does like health based damage, so like that shreds DK, then you have someone with like crazy physical damage and armor reduction in the form of a uh, lifestealer aided by the medallion armor reduction which means dragonite who's usually protected from physical damage is in uh, a lot of trouble there and it's just like okay who's gonna front line no one's gonna front line we're all backliners like doesn't have a bkb he can't do damage um i mean not trying to flame anyone of course but like just see how hard that is um, this is why itemization is so important that even if you have a lineup that can win, if you buy the wrong items, I think you will not win. Whereas the other team had a very, they had a very good plan that we covered, right? The frontliner knew he was a frontliner. He built a lot of auras and then he just put himself in front. Lifestealer knew he was like, I'm just straight up damage and I'll just kill whoever built that way. Ogre knew his place, got medallion, Marana doesn't even matter. Pain goes to an extent didn't even matter. All he had to do was alt if uh, we go on life stealer. So yeah, that is it, and we'll leave this up for the like end so you can see it again. My recommendation for you guys as hard supports is to understand what your hero does. So if you are a, a dazzle, understand that your major role is to save people. Learn to position in a way that lets you accomplish your job without dying as much as possible. Learn to itemize in a way that helps you accomplish your job. If there's like an axe in the game or your grave for some reason is not doing much, then you might have to adjust. You might have to learn to build in a way that helps you reduce armor more and like contribute that way. Or learn to build some items that heal like mech to try to get around axe just culling, culling blade people. Um, When you play too many heroes, I think it gets hard to do this. You know, Jakiro has totally different teamfight role than Oracle, than Ogre. Uh, all the different supports, some overlap, yeah, but many people have different jobs. Someone like Shadow Shaman has almost the same job every game. Like, I'm going to hex and shackle someone. In a teamfight, my burst damage does not really matter. Yeah, I'll put it out, but it's like, it's not really my point. I like always going to hex and shackle people sometimes i'll alt too um but no matter who is in the game like you're still looking to disable people but your target will change um and maybe whether you're an initiator or a counter initiator will also change like whether you wait for someone to go on your sniper and then help him or whether you blink forward and hex shackle someone um i recommend that if you're new to the game for someone who doesn't whose role does not change that much but if you play someone like Oracle, that gets hard, where all your spells can be used on your team or the enemy team, except your ult. Um, and so there comes a, a lot of decision-making of, like, which do I do? What do I need? Do I purge my teammate? Do I root the enemy? Like, am I a save or, a, like, a form of initiation with my first spell? My second spell, is that a save or is it a disarm for the enemy? My heal, am I using it as burst damage or am I sort of healing my teammate with if I combine it with, like, my W? Like, my alt, when do I use it on? Who do I use it on? Like, there's so many questions in a team fight that make it a lot harder to do well if you, like, don't know what's going on. So, you know, again, if you're new, try to pick one hero so that you can at least 
like you're always making the decisions from the same hero as opposed to like all right i have a totally new job as this different hero I, I hadn't even figured out the last hero and now here i am starting from scratch on this next hero it's just going to make it harder and when you learn to play just your own hero like so i i just played a lot of jakiro once i knew my role as jakiro it became easier to learn what other people did and how to fit myself in there so if i knew like sometimes i can max my stun sometimes i can max my damage now I can shift it to my teammates. So when my teammates have a lot of stuns, it's like, okay, let me get more damage. And if we have no stuns, then I know, okay, let me shift and get my ice path up so we have a, a stun. Um, once you know your hero, you're able to learn other heroes, which help a lot. So that now if I play, I don't know, a different hero, like Shadow Shaman instead of Jakiro, I now have to learn Shadow Shaman, but... I already know how the other heroes in my game function. So it's like, oh, I played with a Dragon Knight when I was Jakiro, and I know how this is this is how Dragon Knight functions. So even though I'm sort of learning Shadow Shaman, I can sort of fit myself in around what I already know about Dragon Knight. But if you're always shifting around new heroes, you only focus on your own hero, you don't learn others. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Hope it was helpful. Next video tomorrow on buybacks, I think. Yeah. Goodbye!